Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome along to the Amatex Solar State Controls month, monthly webinar. Uh, this month, we are going to talk about UPS semiconductors, uh, the semiconductors that are used inside UPSs. As always, if you could let me know that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be appreciated. Let me turn myself up a little bit. Um, I'll give everybody a chance to put in the chat whether you can hear me and let everybody else join the webinar. Um, just give you a few moments, okay? Okay, they can hear me loud and clear. It's always a good thing. What's a webinar if you can't hear the person who is teaching uh, the class? So my name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager for Amatech Solid State Controls, and I work out of the, the Houston office down in Stafford, um, very close to the Sugarland area. Uh, this, this is where our uh, UPS training center is. I have, goodness me, uh, over 20 years in the industrial UPS industry now. Um, I started, believe it or not, the week of uh 9-11 so it was september 2001 that i first started working in ups's so 21 years um i've worked with all major ups charger manufacturers um uh, so i'm quite knowledgeable and versed on all the different designs um the platform that we use is called webinar jam for this webinar uh, there will be a lag of around 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and me seeing any questions and that's because webinar jam um, has to do some processing of the data because it's got to send it out to windows based systems ios based systems and android based systems so it's got to convert that signal uh, for all three of them so there is about a 15 to 30 second delay so when I'm talking, you're going to hear it about 15 to 30 seconds later. So if you put uh, a question in the chat or in the q and I'm not going to see it until about 15 to 30 seconds after I've been talking about that issue. For that reason, what I tend to do is leave all the Q&A questions until at the very end, um, and then I'll discuss them uh, then. But if I do see something pertinent pop up, I will try and address it as we're going through the webinar. Uh, Webinar Jam does have a panic button. If I see in the chat bar that people can't hear me anymore or I uh, I feel like there's something going wrong with the webinar technically, then I can press a panic button. It closes this room, it reopens another room, invites everybody back in, and we just carry on seamlessly from where we left off. A very popular question that we get is, will the webinar be recorded? And the answer to that is yes. If you registered for this webinar, uh, you will receive a link um, after the webinar is complete that takes you to the, the recorded version of the webinar within Webinar Jam. The problem with that is it treats it like it's a new webinar. So if you press play, you can't rewind or fast forward or do, do anything with the video. Um, you just press play and it starts and goes from start to finish. Our fantastic um, marketing team, what they do is they take that video, they convert that into an MP4, and then they upload it to our Amatech Solid, Amatech Solid State Controls uh, YouTube site. Um, that takes about 24 hours for them to do. London has put the, the link into the chat already. Thank you, London. And um, you will be able to share watch, pause, rewind, do whatever you want to do um, with that video once it is up. It's a public website. Um, there are no restrictions uh, to those videos. And the webinar should last around an hour. Um, so hopefully I'm going to stay on schedule today. I'm going to try everything I can to do so anyway. Okay. So the outcomes for this is to understand the most common semiconductors used in industrial UPS systems, understand how each of those semiconductor works, discuss the power flow and the general operation of each one of those semiconductors, and then discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of the semiconductors. So hopefully that's what we will learn uh, today. So in its most basic form, any semiconductor 
any power semiconductor that is used inside a UPS is basically a switch. OK, that's the way that you've got to look at it. Um, many people overcomplicate things. What I try and do is simplify things to the most basic form that I can. So um, in this circumstance, that's why I like to say all semiconductors within the UPS act like a switch. So you can see uh, we have our switch here um, and it is open just now. So therefore, you know, basic electronic theory, no power can flow through that switch. So the lamp will be off. OK, that makes sense. And obviously we have our DC source here. So let's say, you know, for ease, let's call that a nine volt battery. But if we then close the switch, then it's as if the switch isn't there, it's a short circuit. So power can flow through to the lamp and the lamp lights, okay? Open the lamp doesn't light, close the light, the lamp does light. Makes sense. So get that, let that sit in your head a little bit. So. We use semiconductors and UPSs as switches. They are either on or they are off. We're not talking about any amplification regions or linear graphs or any fancy stuff about the semiconductor itself. It's either on or it is off. Simple as that. So the first semiconductor we're going to discuss today is the most basic one. It's a diode. OK, and I'm not going to go into PN junctions and doping and holes and all that kind of stuff in the diode. Let's just press the I believe button, a diode is what everybody says it is. It is a device that has an anode on one side, a cathode on the other side. And the rule of a diode is current can only flow from anode to cathode. And current can only flow from anode to cathode when the anode is more positive than the cathode. OK, as in voltage. So, you know, voltage drives current. So we have to have a positive voltage on the anode with respect to the cathode for current to flow. Hopefully that makes sense. But if we try and uh, make current flow the other way and we make the cathode more positive than the anode, and we try to force current through the other direction, the diode blocks the current flow. Now, when a lot of people get confused sometimes about the symbol diagrams for a diode, which way does a current flow? I like to say, you can see here that this is an arrow, and there's the arrow head there showing you the way that current flows, and there's an arrow head there. So for a diode, you know that if the symbol is like that, then you will have a left to right current flow. And the other way I like to look at it is when you see this line here, that's saying, OK, if we're trying to go through that way, that's not going to allow us to get through. So current is blocked from right to left when the diode is drawn like this. OK. So I like analogies. Electricity is hard enough as it is. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. Well, you shouldn't be able to smell it if you have you've let the magic smoke out, which is never a good thing. <laughs> but um, so a mechanical, a mechanical equivalent is always good. So the mechanical equivalent of a diode is a check valve. And this is the representation of a check, a check valve on the screen here. You can see on the left hand side, this is where um, water, oil, whatever it is, is uh, coming into the check valve. And then we have this clapper here. And the clapper or the flap is closed at this moment in time. OK, um, we haven't started flowing uh, water or oil in this pipe yet. So it's closed at this time. And when water starts to flow, then the, the flap will move up to this position here and will allow oil to flow or water to flow through that way. So hopefully that makes sense. And then, obviously, if oil or water tries to flow through the other way from right to left, 
then the flap is closed and water cannot get through. So you can see why um, a diode is very, very similar to a, uh, a check valve. Hopefully that makes sense in your head. So we're going to use this circuit diagram a lot throughout this presentation. So now instead of there being uh, a switch in this circuit, we have now put a diode in the circuit. And we have put the diode with the anode on the positive side of the source. OK, so this is the positive side of the source. And the cathode um, is connected down to the negative side. So we do have a positive to negative um, voltage anode to cathode so you can see the green line there the diode will conduct and will allow power through to the light and the lamp lights in this configuration okay if we put the diode in the other way this is the exact same circuit but all we've done is turn the diode around then we still have positive on this leg here and we have negative here. So we're trying to force current the wrong way through the diode. It will not flow. So therefore the lamp will be off. It really is as simple as that. Um, that is what the diode is doing. So it allows current in one direction, but not in the other. So previously, you can see this was a DC source, okay? So now we are going to introduce AC into the circuit, okay? So an AC waveform has both positive and negative halves of the cycle, okay? So on this drawing here, we're talking about, uh, you can see here, this arrow is pointing towards the positive cycles of uh, the sine wave. And for the positive cycles, the, the anode is positive with respect to the cathode, so current is allowed to flow. So the yellow waveform is the input to the diode, and the green waveform is what you would measure with an oscilloscope connected across the lamp. And you can see that only the positive halves of the sine wave are being conducted and therefore the lamp will be half dim because only half the power is getting through to the load circuit. Okay. And to prove that even more, um, we're going to look at the bottom half of each of these sine waves. In that circumstance, the cathode is going to be more positive than the anode. We're going to try and force current to go through this way here the diode says nope that's not how i work you cannot pass current through that way there so this bottom half of the sine wave disappears completely when you measure across uh, the lamp here so um, that is why only the positive cycle is getting through to the lamp okay and actually if i go back here no it's on the next wave the next one i think so believe it or not, in this most simplest form, we have just transformed AC here into DC here. Because if you look at this waveform here, it is all above the zero volt line. So here's a zero volt line here. So that means current is only flowing in one direction. Yes, the amplitude is changing, but that doesn't matter. DC is direct current. Current is only moving in one direction. So the current is moving in that direction there, that direction there, and that direction there. So we have created DC by simply putting a diode uh, in series with um, AC source. Simple as that. And this is a good example of what a diode, a power diode, looks like out in the field. There are two connections. Um, this is a stud mounted diode. So you can see there's a bolt here. That side will be bolted to a heat sink. OK, and then the heat sink actually becomes part of the circuit um, that the current is flowing through. Um, and this side here, you will connect this to um, a cable 
um, a bus bar, whatever it is that you want to connect to. And depending on the, the diode will depend on which way the current uh, flows. On this one here, I can see that there's a red sleeve here. I know that the red is cathode. So I know that this is an anode. So the stud side on the left is an anode and on the right, so this one here is the cathode. And if you go down to here, you can see down here, all, nearly all semiconductors have a diagram of the device printed on the side of it, and it will be printed in the correct um, direction. So you can see here that the cathode on this side will be the stud and the anode will be uh, this lead that comes off of it. So you can see they do look very, very similar, but they are completely opposite devices. So be very careful when you're replacing diodes out in the field and make sure you have the correct diode to replace the one that is being removed from the system. Okay. And there's just a close up of the, the diagram on the side of the diode. And here's a different pack. This is called a multi-pack. There's two diodes in here. And you can see this is uh, terminal three, this is terminal two, and this is terminal one. So we have a diode, anode here, and cathode here. And then we have another diode going this way. And the anode here and the cathode here. So this terminal in the middle here is common to both cathodes, okay? So hopefully that gives you a good idea of how a diode works. So what we're gonna move on to next is a silicon controlled rectifier or an SCR, or some people call them thyristors. Um, I'm from Europe, so I call them thyristors and it's similar to Kleenex, um, you know, Kleenex is a tissue, but for some reason, everybody in America started calling a tissue Kleenex. In Europe, um, an SCR manufacturer called their SCRs a thyristor, and that took off. So most SCRs in Europe are called thyristors, but the term is interchangeable. Um, a thyristor is just a brand name of an SCR, if that makes sense. And it is exactly the same as a diode, except for this pesky little thing here, which is the gate. You can see we have the anode and we have the cathode, and it's exactly the same symbol for a diode, okay? But with the addition of a gate, okay? And you can see that the gate isn't quite attached to the cathode or the anode. It actually goes into the SCR at a different point. Um, and we'll explain that in just a moment. Okay. So I heard everybody shout, okay, we like that mechanical equivalent of a diode. So what's the mechanical equivalent of an SCR? Well, it's very complicated, but I like to call it a very special check valve. Okay. Um, all it is is the same check valve drawing as we had before. But what we've done down here in the bottom, we have added this gate signal. And as you can see, when we haven't sent a signal to the gate, it is preventing the flapper from moving at all. The flapper cannot move when that gate is in place. So if you do not send a gate signal to an SCR, it's as if there is an open circuit. It will not conduct that way and it will not conduct that way, okay? It is an open circuit in the schematic. Doesn't matter what you do, it will not turn on unless you have a gate signal, okay? If we send, oh, let me go back. If we send a signal and that pulls that gate down that way and allows the flapper to move, basically what we're saying is if you send a gate signal to an SCR, it turns it into a diode, okay? It doesn't turn it in, uh, into uh, any kind of magical device. All it's doing is it's giving it permission to act like a diode. So everything else still applies. Current will only flow from anode to cathode. It will not flow from cathode to anode, okay?
So here's that circuit that we've been using um, all morning already. And now, rather than have a diode, we have now inserted an SCR. Now, we have to send a signal to this SCR. So I've added a very small circuit here. We have a push button here, which is open at this moment in time. And then we have a resistor, uh, which just acts as a current limiting resistor to limit the current that flows into this gate drive so it doesn't damage the SCR. It's just a, a thing that engineers do, okay? So at this moment in time, the switch is open. So we are not sending a gate signal to the SCR. So no power will flow through that SCR. Yes, we do have positive on the anode with respect to cathode, but because we haven't sent a signal to the gate and we haven't told the SCR to start behaving like a diode, nothing happens. It's as if the SCR is not there. And that's exactly the same if we changed the positive and negative from the DC source. If we made this side positive now, we've got positive on the cathode with respect to the anode. We haven't sent a signal and it doesn't matter. It's not going to allow current to flow in either direction unless we get a signal to turn that gate on. Very important point. But if we do press this switch here and we do send a signal to the gate of the SCR, then it does start behaving exactly like a diode. We have positive on the anode with respect to the cathode. So current is allowed to flow and the lamp will turn on. OK, but here's where it gets really interesting. When we remove the gate signal from an SCR, the SCR does not turn off. And there's a, a very good reason for that. And basically, the SCR says, if, if I have positive on my anode with respect to my cathode, there is current flowing through me, and I have had a gate signal sent to me, that's enough for me to turn on and I will stay on even when that gate signal is removed, when we are supplying power from a DC source. So basically, all you have to do is switch an SCR on once when it's connected to an, um, a DC source. And as long as this is positive with respect to this and current is flowing, that SCR will stay on forever or until this DC source depletes, like I said, if it was a nine volt battery, if the nine volt battery eventually gets drained because of the lamp, then eventually it will switch off because there is no power left in the DC source. So the only way that you can switch that SCR off manually without waiting for the DC source to uh, decay down to zero is to add a switch to add something that breaks the current flowing through the SCR, something that removes the positive to negative uh, voltage um, across that SCR. And the only way to do that is to use something that breaks the cycle of the current. Then the lamp will turn off. And then what you can do is if you then close this switch, the SCR still won't turn on now until you send it a gate signal again. OK. So basically, once you send a signal to an SCR and the anode is more positive than the cathode, it will turn on. If you remove that signal, it stays on until the current flowing through it goes down to zero. That's pretty much how it works. And it's an important distinction because when we get into how they are used inside the UPS system, um, you will see how a sine wave um, interacts with an SCR and how convenient it is that it goes over the zero crossing point. But we'll get to that in a moment. And these are what SCRs look like out in the real world. There's a big stud mounted SCR 
pretty much identical to um, the diode. But now you can see that there are two small leads coming from the body of the SCR. And one is the gate and one is the cathode. The red one is the cathode, because I know this is the main cathode terminal. And the red lead here, that is the cathode terminal. And then this white lead here is the gate terminal. And what we actually have to do, that will go back to a control board and we will have something that sends a potential, let's say five volts from the gate signal, the white signal with respect to the red signal, the cathode lead. This one here is a hockey puck diode. Basically you have this top surface here that could be the cathode in this instance. And then the bottom surface here is the anode. And then that has to be sandwiched between a heat sink. Um, or you can use this special device here, which pushes down on that hockey puck SCR. And what a lot of people don't realize about an SCR, when it's sitting on the desk like this, you can't really test it because it has to be compressed to work. The internal uh, layers of that SCR have to be compressed for it to work. So it's very difficult to bench test a hockey puck SCR outside of its heat sink where it is pressurized and uh, torqued at the right setting together between two heat sinks. And then these two versions here are multi-packs. Um, you can see uh, there's one SCR on that package and one SCR on that package. Um, and you can see better here that that's actually the gate cathode terminals um, there for both SCRs. OK, then you can see not very well, but there's an SCR there and there's an SCR there. So I can't see from this drawing, but it could well be that that's uh, like that. And then probably that's like that. Um, so there's two SCRs in that pack. But that's what they look like out in the wild in big power devices. So that's an SCR. So the last device that we're going to talk about today is an IGBT, which is an insulated gate bipolar transistor. And that's just a fancy term for uh, a special transistor that is used in high power applications. Once again, you can see that there are three terminals. We do have a gate, so it's similar to uh, an SCR, but instead of having an anode and cathode now, we now have a C and an E, which is a collector and an emitter. Okay. This is the schematic symbol for an IGBT. This is actually the equivalent diagram of an IGBT um, because near enough all manufacturers of IGBTs have this reverse parallel connected diode in there. Um, I'm not going to go really into what it's for, but it's to try and prevent the IGBT from being damaged when current is stopped flowing through it because uh, IGBTs are sensitive devices. If you stop current flowing through it, there is going to be some inductive kitback um, and this diode allows that energy to be dissipated rather than uh, damage the IGBT itself, okay? But that's, you don't need to know that just now. Um, we're gonna go on to basically, we're gonna just talk about the gate collector and the emitter circuit. And the most basic circuit equivalent of an IGBT is this picture here. Now, obviously I am not telling anybody to put their hands anywhere near electronics or electricity. This is just an analogy. But basically, you have your collector here and you have your emitter here. OK, um, let's say we have uh, our nine volt battery positive uh, coming in here. OK, and then let's say we've got uh, we've got a lamp connected down here and then that goes back to our zero volts of the battery. What we're doing is if this push button, this spring loaded push button is open, then current doesn't flow through here, so the lamp does not light. And if we, oh, my apologies. If we push the push button and we close this circuit, then current does flow through and the lamp does light. It really is as simple as that. So 
we push the button, current flows. Unlike an SCR, we turn it off by removing the push button uh, and it will turn off instantaneously. We don't have to wait for current to stop flowing or for the anode to, to be uh, more positive in the cathode, nothing like that in an ITBT. It's either on when you send a gate signal or it's off when you don't send a gate signal. Really is as simple as that, on or off. No in-betweens when it comes to power semiconductors inside of the UPS. And if that's not really good for you, here's an actual mechanical equivalent that's out in a lot of the petrochemical plants that we work in, and it's a solenoid control valve. So once again, it's similar to a check valve. We have fluid flowing through here from the collector into here, but you can see this stopper is down. So the fluid cannot flow from the collector to the emitter when the stopper is down, okay? And the stopper is controlled by this electromagnet at the top here, okay? So if we send a gate signal to this solenoid control valve, what happens is this uh, armature energizes, creates a field, and it pulls this, um, this plunger upwards. It gets attracted to the magnet, and you can see that current will now flow or oil will now flow from the collector to uh, the emitter. But obviously, as soon as we remove that gate signal, the plunger goes back to being closed straight away and the flow will turn off. So once again, with an IGBT, you send a gate signal, it's on, you remove the gate signal and it is off. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And the familiar circuit we've been using all day so far. Instead of having a switch or a diode or an SCR, we have now replaced that with an IGBT, okay? We still have the same gate signal um, circuit attached to it, okay? And we have this push button and the push button is open just now. So the push button's open, no current gets to the gate circuit. So the IGBT says, nope, you are not turning me on, so I am not going to allow current to flow. The lamp is off. It's as simple as that. And then we press switch one. We send a gate signal to the IGBT. That says, okay, IGBT, you can turn on now. And it acts like a short circuit and current flows through into the lamp and the lamp is on. It really is as simple as that. Gate signal on, no gate signal off. OK. Um, I don't know why I have gate driver. OK, I'm just saying gate signal on, gate signal off. Same slide. And this is what an IGBT looks out looks like out in the wild. There's two different versions there. But you can see on the side of the package, once again, uh, we have terminal one, terminal two and terminal three. So it's saying there is one uh, IGBT connected that way there, okay? And then the other one is connected that way there, okay? And then these are the gate signals that go to the IGBT. And that is the same on this one here as well. They're just different manufacturers, different models. So how is each device used? Well, for a diode, it can be used for rectification. That is the, by far the most common um, usage of a diode in power electronics. And this most simple circuit here, we have our AC supply coming in here. Okay, this is our sine wave coming in. OK, and then if we have our diode here and then we measure across this resistor. So basically, when you see this waveform here, I'm measuring across this resistor with an oscilloscope. That is a resulting waveform. Um, we have AC going in and this is a waveform coming out. The question is, is this DC? I mentioned it earlier, earlier on in this slide. Yes, this is DC. 
because the current is flowing in one direction. It is direct current. On this, on this, If we go to the input here, current is flowing that way there, but current is flowing that way there, and then current is going back to flowing this way here. On this, this is pulsating DC because the current flows in the same direction every time we get a pulse. Yes, the amplitude changes, but the direction does not. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's a half wave rectifier, but most commonly we want to use both sides, both the positive half and the negative half of the sine wave. So we, well, not we, some clever guy back in the 1800s or whenever it was uh, who had nothing better to do than figure out how to uh, uh, use diodes in a circuit came up with this full wave rectification circuit. And it's a very, very clever circuit. What it does is it flips the negative portion of the sine wave up to the top. And I'll show you how it does that. Okay. So the red is for the positive part of the waveform. Okay. We're talking about this point here. So that is going to be positive here with respect to here. So if you follow the red line there and follow the arrows, it goes through. So it makes this top bus bar here positive. And then that flows all the way down through the load, back up through this other red diode here, back to this point here. And that creates these positive halves of the sine wave. OK. But obviously there's a cathode here. Current cannot go down that way through this diode. And current cannot flow back up here to this side here, because if that's positive, then we're going positive to positive. There is no potential across that diode, so that's not going to conduct. Current has to flow through this diode and this diode when we're looking at this positive half of the sine wave here. And then amazingly, when we have this bottom part of the sine wave, this side of the power supply now becomes positive with respect to that. So if you follow the circuit, we go up through this. This is now positive with respect to that. So that allows power to flow. And we have to get back to this terminal here. Remember, there has to be a potential. So we go down through here and we have to go through this diode to get back here. And that flips up this portion of the sine wave. So now current is flowing in that direction. And when it was flowing in that direction there, we have now flipped it. And now it is flowing in that direction there. So now each of these pulses, the current is flowing in one direction. So this is definitely getting more and more like the DC we see when we charge batteries. The problem with diodes is we have no control over them. So we're going to discuss a 120 volt input to a system. 120 volt input um, is actually has 170 volts peak to peak, sorry, uh, peak um, so it's actually 340 volts peak to peak. So you can see here that 170 volts is the size of this sine wave on the top here. OK, so that means if we measured the RMS of this output here, it's going to be 170 volts um, peak. OK, now, if you put it on, if, if you put your uh, fluke on DC, there's a, um, a mathematical equation that's used to calculate the average um, DC from an AC input. And that is V is equal to two times the, the voltage in divided by pi. And that basically works out as 108 volts DC. So for a 170 volt peak waveform, we're going to have 108 volts DC out. Stick with me here. OK, I know this is a lot of numbers and a little bit confusing but you'll see where I'm going with this, okay? So for exactly 120 volts, we're gonna get approximately 108 volts DC out. 120 volts AC input, 108 volts DC output, okay? But we have no control over the grid or the generation that comes into our houses, into the power plants or anything like that. So let's say, um, we have a low voltage 
the 120 volt input has gone down to 100 volts. Well, the peak then reduces down to 142 volts. Okay, so that means the peaks on our output here are going to be 142 volts. And the equation says rather than having a, um, what did we have before, 108 volts, we've now gone down to 90 volts. So as the AC input into the, the rectifier bridge goes down, so does the DC output. OK, and that's not good because rectifiers in most cases are used to charge batteries and batteries are actually very, very sensitive to the, the charge voltage. They really, really want a set voltage um, based on the uh, chemicals within it and the temperature of the room. And for a lead acid battery, that's 2.25 volts per cell um, generically. OK. So if we had a charge of a just used diodes, as the AC input fluctuates, the DC output is going to fluctuate. So therefore, the charge that's going to the batteries is going to go up and down, which is either going to cause the batteries to be overcharged if it goes up or uh, discharged when they go down. And it's going to reduce the life of the battery. So what we can do is we can add control by adding SCRs. We can add two SCRs into the bridge. Remember this bridge? Um, we had four diodes before. Well, now we're introducing two SCRs and we can have a gate signal. So what we can do is we can tell the SCR when to turn on in the, the sine wave. And the important thing to remember with the SCR is remember I said that it will turn off when we have no current flow no current flowing through it. Well, when the sine wave changes direction, it goes past the zero volt point. And at that point there, there is zero volts on this side. There is zero volts on this side. So there is no potential across the anode and cathode of an SCR. So that means it automatically switches itself off and then it waits for the next gate signal to come along to turn itself on. So in a rectifier, we can tell an SCR when to turn on in the cycle but we can't tell it when to turn off. It will always turn off at the zero crossing point, And therefore we use that. And what we can do, you can see here, this waveform is allowing quite a lot of the sine wave through. This is allowing half of the sine wave through. This is allowing uh, a very small portion of the sine wave through. And this is nearly allowing all of the sine wave through. That can all be done by telling the SCR when to turn on. So if we go back to our diagram and uh, the gate drive point, we're turning it on pretty much exactly at the halfway point in the sine wave. That's when the gate signal came on. That will be the resulting uh, signal on the output because we've got an AC source coming in. And once it gets to that zero volts, all we're doing is sending an instantaneous signal to the gate saying, turn on. The gate signal is removed straight after that usually. Um, and the SCR will stay on until it gets to the zero crossing point there. So an SCR can regulate the output for a changing input or a higher load demand, and I'll show you how. So we said for a low input voltage that the peak of the sine wave is going to be 142 volts. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to switch on the uh, SCRs earlier on in the cycle. So you can see we're going to turn the SCRs on at that point there. And that, let's say what we're looking for is 100 volts on the output. So let's say for this low input voltage, we're going to turn the SCRs on earlier and we're going to maintain this output at 100 volts. For the normal input voltage for a 120 volt system, which is 170 volts peak, I know you can't see it very well, but if you look, we're starting, this is just on the top of the sine wave here for the low voltage. But if we go to this next page, you can see this is actually on the downward side of the sine wave. So we're turning the SCR on later in the cycle. So even though we have a higher voltage going in, we are maintaining this output voltage at 100 volts because basically it's a mathematical derivative of the average power that's getting through to the output. And then if we had an extremely high input voltage and the peak goes up to 190 volts, 
then we're only allowing a tiny portion of a sine wave through to maintain that 100 volts average on the output, okay? But once again, every single time we get to the zero crossing point, it turns the SCR off and then it waits for this next gate signal to turn on. So that's used in a charger. SCRs and diodes are always used in rectification um, and charging. Okay, now we're going to talk about the IGBTs quickly, and they're usually used in the inverters to convert DC back into AC. And we're going to show you in, the, in its most basic form how that's done. So we have our DC source here, which is our battery. Okay, and this switch here is open. So no power flows through this IGBT. And instead of a lamp, we're going to have a transformer on the output here. Okay. What happens is if we send a signal, if we press this button here and send a signal to the gate of the IGBT, we get a positive pulse, and that will be the peak voltage of the battery. For ease, let's say that's 9 volts just now. It's a, just a general 9-volt battery. Then the peak here will be 9 volts. Okay? So we press it on, it goes up to nine volts, and then we remove the signal, it goes back to zero. So we've created a square wave pulse there. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And then what we can do for an inverter bridge is we can use what's called pulse width modulation. And uh, what we can do is you can see here, let's still stick with the nine volts for just now. That, vo that voltage here is nine volts. All we're doing is changing the amount of time that we keep our finger pressed on the, the gate signal, okay? Um, these are short pulses, and then here, they're longer pulses. And as you can see here, this is the average voltage of these pulses, and this is the average voltage of the, the smaller pulses. So it's all based on, like the uh, output of the rectifier, it's all based on the average mathematical voltage that comes out with those pulses. Stick with me once again, it's a little bit complicated, I know, but these next drawings may help you understand what's going on. So that was the most simplified version of how an IGBT works with a transformer. This is actually how it works in an inverter itself, and it uses what's called an H-bridge circuit diagram, okay? And we have four IGBTs connected here. And what it is, if you look at it, it looks like an H, which is why it's called an H bridge. So if we turn this pair labeled A of IGBTs on, and we've got our positive coming in here, that allows current to flow down through A, down through the transformer, and back out this way here. And what we're actually doing is we're not just turning these transistors on once, we're turning them on uh, with respect to this waveform here. So a very small pulse, pulses are getting bigger as we get to the middle, and then they get smaller as they get to the end. And remember I said the average, if you do a mathematical average of this waveform here, okay, it turns into a sine wave mathematically. OK, you do have to put some capacitors on the output and some inductance to, to filter it out to make it look like a nice sine wave. But mathematically, it looks like a sine wave. Now, that's the top half of the sine wave we've created there. Now, what we need to do is instead of switching the A transistors on, we're going to switch the B transistors on. So we have B here and we have B here. And now, if you follow this very carefully, we go down here and instead of going to this side of the transformer, we're going to this side of the transformer. We're going to make that positive with respect to that. And now we get the bottom half of the sine wave uh, out here using PWM, uh, pulse width modulation, on the output. So basically all we're doing is switching the A pair of transistors on following that pulse width modulated waveform. And then we're doing the same for the B transistors, just constantly changing those um, to create a 60 hertz uh, 
or in Europe and other places, a 50 hertz waveform. And that, if you measure on the output, um, let me just show you. If we measured across this transformer here on the primary side of the transformer, this is actually the waveform that we would see, okay? And then if we measured on the secondary side, we would see this beautiful sine wave because it's been filtered. Okay, so that is everything in my presentation about um, the different devices that I used inside uh, a UPS. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or in the Q&A, and I will try and um, answer any of those questions. Uh, so we have one. Uh, the question is, can you go over the wiring of the gate conductors with the SCRs, please? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Can you go over the wiring of the gate conductors? Um, if we go back to the SCRs, unfortunately, the way Webinar Jam works is I have to go through all the slides manually to get back to where I am. Okay, so here it is here, here's the SCR. So this is going to be the white wire, okay? And depending on the specifics of the SCR, all the manufacturers have a different gate voltage that's required to turn their SCRs on. I always like to use a five volt value. It's not far away from, from what's required. So what you actually have to do, instead of having a switch here, this will actually go back to a control board, okay? I'll just put CB control board here, okay? And that is what sends the signal to the gate on the white. But what the control board will also do is it will have to have a reference to the, the cathode as well going into this pin here. So what it's actually doing is it's sending a five volt signal between those two pins. It has to be a five volt signal gate with respect to WRT cathode C, okay? Um, so gate with respect to cathode is how you send a signal to the SCR. And once again, I picked a five volt, um, it could be three volts, it could be eight volts, all SCR manufacturers are different um, and you would get that reading from the data switch, from the data sheet, should I say. But that is the signal that the SCR is looking for, and that's how you control it. It's from a control board. Okay. Um, somebody has asked, can we get a copy of your presentation? And unfortunately, the simple answer to that is no. Um, I'm sorry to say. The presentation is proprietary, but the video will be posted on YouTube. So you have all of the slides when you go to YouTube. You can share it with people. People can watch it. So um, although I can't supply um, the actual PowerPoint presentation, you can watch this again and you can view it on YouTube. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, not just now. Um, London is just posted um, in the chat bar. The recording of this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and she's put the link in there for you. If you click on that link, you can go in there, you can bookmark or subscribe to our channel um, and then click the alarm bell and then you will get notified every single time a new video gets put up on our YouTube site. And all of our previous presentations are on that YouTube channel as well. So you can go in there, view them, um, and there's some really interesting information on there for you as well. And also, um, if you need any additional assistance from the Amatec Field Service Department, um, or if you have any questions about this webinar, you can use the Contact Us uh, link on our webpage. Um, London has provided the link for you there. You can email us at sci.marketing at amatech.com or you can call 1-800-635-7300 and somebody will get back to you or somebody will answer the phone in truth. 
Okay, so we don't seem to be getting any more questions in at this time. Um, it looks like I'm early for once, which is a miracle. Um, uh, I'd like to take this time to thank you for taking time out of your day and watching this webinar. I do really appreciate it. I know your days are extremely busy um, and I hope you got some interesting information out of this webinar. Um, so you will receive a survey after this webinar. I'm always looking for subjects and topics that you want me to discuss um, going forward at other webinars. In truth, this webinar that I did today, I did about 12 months ago. I'm starting to repeat a lot of the webinars. I'd rather give you a di uh, um, original content. So if it's, there is something um, in specifics that you would like me to discuss in reference to UPSs, please fill out that survey. I think it's question five in that survey that says, is there any other topic that you would like me to discuss? I read every single one of those surveys, okay? So if you have a topic and I think that it's something I can present at the next webinar, then I will definitely do that. So um, please do uh, reply or even just use the uh, sci.marketing at amatech.com email and say, I would like to learn about uh, um, stationary batteries or um, how does an inverter work or or whatever it is, just let us know and we will try and create a tailored presentation for that subject. <laughs> and you are right, Aristotle, it is a miracle. How all of this works is an absolute miracle. There's some clever people out there back in the 18, 1900s. Ooh, static switches. Um, I could do that. I think I've got a presentation on static switches. I think I will do that um, at one point. But um, what I'll say to everybody is thanks again for joining us. Uh, take care wherever you are. And I hope to speak to you again in a month's time at our next Amatech Solid State Control webinar. Take care until next time.